Okay, so now we're using the actual microphone. All right. Here we go. Okay, so welcome everyone to the Ilm Tech Podcast. Thank you for joining us on our very first episode. Super excited to be here and excited to have our first guest, Dr. Bill Moody from the University of Washington's uh, Department of Biology. He is my neuroscience professor for a little bit of background for all of the viewers. Um, sorry, listeners. I can't edit it. It's fine. So let's, let's just keep going. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you for being here. Welcome. Uh, my pleasure. When you invited me to do this, it was uh, something I found very interesting. Yeah, so I guess going back to what started this, what sparked the entire thought was the House of Wisdom. And I think you've done a lot of reading about the House of Wisdom, so can you introduce it for every, everyone who's listening, what the idea is and uh, where your interest in it came from? Sure. Um, my interest came, came from originally listening to a, a professor named Ressa Aslan, who was a, a, a scholar um, in California, religious history scholar, and it came from watching this interview on Fox News where they kept asking him why he would write a biography of Jesus if he was a Muslim. And he said, that's my job. I'm a scholar. Um, and he wrote a wonderful book of the history of Islam. And I read that book. And in it, you could read about something called the House of Wisdom, which in about 1000 AD in the Christian calendar um, was a gathering of scholars that was created by the, you know, the burgeoning um, world of Islam, uh, purportedly to translate some of the ancient Greek scientific texts into Arabic. And they gathered scholars of all religions, um, and they started to translate. And then apparently what they did is decided to test some of the ideas in those texts. And it, and it went from it being a translation exercise to almost the mm -hmm. early development of the scientific method. Mm -hmm. And from there, it exploded into the early development of things like algebra and numbers, the real numbers using the number zero as a placeholder, the idea of hospitals with wards. And to me, it was just a lesson of how much work we might have to do to catch up to something that happened a thousand years ago by getting people of all faiths together in one common pursuit of knowledge. Has this uh, had any effect or any bearing upon, or even a relation to work you've done with your own research or your own research experience? Um, I think uh, not directly with the research I do, but um, being a neuroscientist, you study the commonalities of the brain across all animals. Mm -hmm. And when you see how similar the nervous system functions are between animals of even tremendous difference, like frogs and humans, the differences in the brain between human, different humans just becomes nothing. And I yeah. think you start to see the commonality among people so much more strongly when you realize that almost everything in the brain that makes them humans is identical among all people. It's an interesting way to put it. It's like, yeah, I guess it's just a matter of scale how you look at the different perspectives of difference. So going back to your research, uh, on your bio it says you study spontaneous electrical brain activity in development. Can you expand a little bit more about what that means for those of us who don't know anything about neuroscience? Sure. Um, I think everybody's comfortable with the fact that the brain uses electrical signals to process information on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, mm -hmm. That's what you do. Less comfortable for people was the idea that the brain used electrical activity early in development to wire itself in the first place. And my lab was one of the labs that um, made some of the discoveries in that field. Mm -hmm. And so recently what we've done is we've tried to develop methods that allow us to measure activity over the entire brain of a living animal um, during the first week of life, in this case a mouse. And we use optical methods to do that. And so we're able to watch exactly how the entire surface of the brain engages in electrical signaling at the time when it's still developing. Um, and one of the most interesting things we've discovered is that um, one of those signals that runs the development of the brain is a huge set of waves of activity that cross the entire brain at once. That's something that does not occur normally in your waking life because it would disrupt everything about the signaling of the brain. Right. And the question was, in the first week of life of a mouse, how come it doesn't disrupt the behavior of the mouse? That big lighting up the brain that you showed us. Yes, right? that thing I showed in class where the wave of activity crossed the entire brain 
Yeah. And one of the big questions was, why isn't that disruptive to the animal? So context for uh, those listening, uh, he showed us in class a video of a, a mouse brain, and you see little sparks of activity, but then during certain periods of sleep, just the entire thing lights up. You just see the entire brain light up and just flares up. And so that's what we're talking about right now. And that was our discovery, was in fact the way the brain sorts that activity out and doesn't let it interfere with everything else that's going on, is to put it in sleep. So yeah. when the animal's awake, the brain mm -hmm. uses electrical activity to process information. When it's asleep, it uses different type of electrical activity to help it develop. Um, and I, that the ability to actually you know, have a mouse that's genetically engineered so its nerve cells emit light every time they're active, that's what gave us the ability to just film the activity of the brain rather than try to record it electrically. So if in the context of development, it, it seems to me, my understanding, that it's almost becoming like a chicken or the egg kind of question in the sense that our brain works based on electrical signaling, but electrical signaling is what gave rise to the entire structure of the brain. That's correct. And, it, and it, you know, you can even make that more specific by, by understanding that, you know, the brain starts to develop according to a genetic program, and then it engages in a spontaneous electrical activity that helps it develop further. Then it becomes capable of taking in sensory information. Then the sensory information coming in generates signals that help the brain develop more, and then you're off and running to become an adult brain. So it is a bit of a chicken and an egg question. So what does spontaneous mean? It's like... <laughs> That's a great question. Like, there has to be some kind of cause, right? That I, You've done very well in my class. <laughs> um, yes, I, I think in, in a review I wrote about this, this question once was, I defined spontaneous as a word that was used by scientists to mean we don't know what happens. We don't know what causes the activity. Um, all we knew about that type of activity early in brain development was that it wasn't caused by sensory information coming in like light or sound or touch. It was generated within the brain. And part of research in my lab was to figure out what caused that, what does spontaneous mean. And we found certain parts of the brain are just optimized to start this activity once a minute or once every five minutes. So how do you go about studying that? I guess on a, on a larger level, you in biology, you encounter a certain phenomenon and you're like, okay, I have no idea how this works. But then, how do you go about piecing that together? You see what I'm saying? It's like, okay, you have this effect. Where do you even begin in trying to isolate the cause? Um, well, you don't do it. You can't do it in isolation. There are thousands of scientists working on these kind of problems around the world. So you read what they've done before, and then you just try to take the next step. Um, for us, it was to start working in living slices of brain tissue that weren't even in the animal, and we got them to generate this type of activity. Mm -hmm. And then we started going through the slices and we just take out a little piece and ask if the activity went away. And sometimes it wouldn't, and we kept going and we kept going, and we found out one little piece we could take away, the activity stopped. Well, oh. there we'd isolated the nerve cells that start the activity. Then you put on a drug that shuts those nerve cells down and you find the activity goes away and you just build it up logically. Um, right. it's, it's amazing how much common sense plays a role in science. Um, there, some, if you look at these experiments, there's nothing to them other than common sense built on some past scientific information. And I think that's one of the reasons I hope that people don't see scientific research as something completely foreign to them. Um, mm. it, it really isn't that. The logic is not foreign to most people once you have the information. So on that note of common sense, I was thinking just the other day that um, about experts in different fields. So if you have an expert historian, you have an expert scientist, are there common thinking patterns that make an expert an expert? And so I thought it was an interesting idea, going back to the entire House of Wisdom idea, is that you had scholars of all different disciplines there. And I wonder if that contributed to the amount of success they had in and the, these commonalities and thinking patterns. So. I'm sure it does, and that's why universities are such exciting places even today to be in. Um, I think all scholars do have a commonality of thinking, which is it's looking for cause, and um, it, looking at information objectively rather than based on your feeling of what it should be, constantly asking questions of whether this is true or that is true, and then testing those ideas. Now, the way you test them is obviously completely different if you're a scientist or a historian. 
But I don't think mm -hmm. the thinking is very different. You have a hypothesis, and then you take in information in support or rejection of the hypothesis. I've had many more ideas turn out to be wrong than turn out to be right. Mm. Interesting. So, um, I, I would say I even had a, a visitor from France once who spent a year in my lab working, and we were working on a problem, and we knew what the mm -hmm. answer was going to be, and we were wrong. And we were wrong about 20 times in a row with 20 different ideas. Wow. We actually put a wastebasket in the middle of the lab, and since he was French, he labeled it la poubelle pour les hypothèses, which means the wastebasket of the hypotheses. And we started <laughs> writing them down, and we were wrong. We'd just throw them in the trash can. It was overflowing before we found the what answer. What were you studying at the time? Um, we were studying electrical activity in an embryo that occurred at the time of cell division. And mm -hmm. no one had actually thought that there might be a cell division specific type of electrical activity. And we discovered it and we found that it was related to the physical strain of the membrane when the cell divides. And it took us what seemed like forever to figure out that that was the cause of the electrical activity. And right. as I said, we had 20 or 30 really wonderful ideas that were completely wrong. So that seems like it's a challenge in biology. My own background being an electrical engineer and being more involved in physics is that uh, you're working with stuff that people make. And so because you, you make all of your own experiments, the systems aren't that complex, but uh, relatively speaking. But it seems that in biology, like you have so many different things going on, it seems really hard to you know, pinpoint cause and effect. It is very hard. I had some electrical engineers in my lab visiting to watch us do some experiments on, um, on neural tissue. And they came in on a Tuesday, we did the experiment, and we got this result. And they came in on a Thursday, and we did the same experiment, and we got a slightly different result. And they said, well, how, the, how could that be? Yeah. And I said, well, it's a different animal, different day, different tissue. I said, well, doesn't it obey the same rules? I said, yes, but in a much more complicated way than you're used to thinking about. Yeah. Biology is difficult. Yeah. It's, um, and another thing I was curious about was, Thinking from an engineering mindset, we always think about like creativity. What can we make? You know, how can we apply this? What can we do with this information? So, where do you see the potential of biology and research like yours in that kind of context? Is it does, does it have that kind of context, or is it, I guess, knowledge for a different pursuit? Oh, I think it's very closely related. There is an entire field known as neural engineering um, and brain computer interfaces. Part of that field is using the output of the brain to activate devices like artificial limbs. We're making tremendous progress in thought-driven artificial limbs where you can voluntarily move yeah. an artificial yeah. arm under the control of your brain. There's a lot of work on that here at our campus, right? A huge amount of work at the University of Washington, the whole several centers of neural engineering. Yeah. Um, but I think even more than that, we're now sometimes um, engineers are looking to the brain to find out how it does things so efficiently and uh, making neurally inspired devices where, mm -hmm. you, where you have artificial neural circuits programmed to function according to the same rules that the brain uses and you find that they do things extremely efficiently. Um, it, it, it's astonishing to me how well that works and so the interface between engineering and neuroscience is just one of the exploding areas of knowledge now. Yeah, I always find it weird when people say the brain is a computer. Because I'm, to me, it's always like you're comparing these two things that are actually pretty different. They work very differently. If you, if you study computer architecture and you study neuroscience, I think it's because they're so different that there's now this push in crossing the two. Absolutely. Yeah, people think of, there's certain things our brain cannot do that a computer can do very well. But really, a computer can only do one thing, which is add numbers fast. Yeah. Right. The brain cannot approach the speed with which a computer can add numbers. But the brain can do a lot of things very much faster and with a lot less energy than a computer can do because it doesn't operate on those principles. So if the computer's fundamental principle is uh, adding numbers together, what's the brain's fundamental principle? Um, I think the brain's fundamental principle is transforming and filtering information in order to keep you alive and it mm. will do anything in order to do that. People have this illusion, for example, that 
your senses report the reality of the outside world, despite a very large amount of evidence that they don't do that. Mm -hmm. What they really do is filter information and retain what you need to stay alive and reject what you don't need. So I think it's the, the, the processing and the changing and the filtering of information that the brain is so good at. So is it important to understand, like, I guess it obviously is important, but how important is it to understand the, uh, I guess, motivation or the purpose of a certain brain structure while you're studying it? In like an overarching kind of sense. I guess I asked the question because the analogy is like, as an engineer, if you have a machine, you have a system or you have a software or something, you contextualize its entire purpose and the way it works based on what it was designed for, what its design parameters are for. And then from there, all the details come. Well, I think, imagine this. Imagine you were sitting in front of a computer or some electronic device and you knew ahead of time that that device was responsible for everything that you are, your entire existence. Mm -hmm. You'd really want to know how that device worked. Yeah. That's what the brain is. It is the organ that's responsible for everything that we are, everything that we sense, we feel, all of our movements, all of our emotions, our entire consciousness and our entire existence sits in that one device. I cannot think of any greater motivation to figure out how something works than the fact that it makes you who you are. Yeah. And that kind of probably brings up another issue in that uh, the entire idea of ethics and when you're, you know, when you're applying science to certain things and you're kind of logically reducing things down to you know, their bare fundamental le level, like what happens to the entire ethics conversation? Has that been something you've thought about a lot? All the time, um, especially in the field of neural engineering. Um, there's, there, there are two kinds of ethics scientists think about. One is the ethics of the experiment itself, the use of animals and all yeah, of those, yeah. those considerations. Um, the ethical questions in neuroscience are more, um, we're learning enough about the brain right now that what we can do to humans um, is much more than we should do. Um, you know, once you can intercept thoughts and intentions in the brain and have them do something like move a limb, and you're in a sense broadcasting the thoughts and intentions of someone's brain to a device, and that's hackable, that's dangerous. Yeah. You have access to things going on in people's brain. I can give you one example which I find particularly frightening. Let's say two examples. One, putting a magnet on the right side of a person's brain while they're conscious and awake. You turn on the magnet and all of a sudden that person can no longer recognize human faces. Turn off the magnet and they can. That's terrifying. Is that what we done with TMS? Transcranial, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, an experiment done in a rat or a, a mouse probably recently where it was genetically altered so that we could activate certain neurons in a part of the brain called the amygdala by light. Mm -hmm. You could put an optical fiber into the skull of that animal, point it at the amygdala, and when you turn on the light, the animal starts to kill things. And when you turn it off, it stops. Nobody thinks that that's a question devoid of ethics. <laughs> yeah, definitely is really scary. Some people, there's this idea that I've encountered at least that uh, people kind of push back against um, science reducing the brain or saying all that you are is your brain and that they, they find it kind of, um, I guess, they lose that romantic aspect of the sense of the self and, you know, this entire idea of the cell just being a clump of neurons and everything. They find that, uh, they, I guess the idea is that that kind of robs life of its beauty. Do you see it that way? Um, I see it exactly the opposite. Um, my sense of the miracle of life, the beauty of life, is so much more intensified by knowing that it comes out of this one structure and in trying to understand the principles of that structure, how it evolved, how it came into being, I think that only increases my sense of wonder at the entire thing. I, I don't want to say I feel sorry for people who, who don't, aren't exposed to those ideas, but uh, there's a depth of feeling that scientists have, I think, that the more you know, the more you know how little you know, and mm -hmm. the more you appreciate how absolutely miraculous this entire structure is. Um, and I, I think the knowledge there just breeds more of a sense of wonder, not less. Yeah. That's always the way I saw it as well. Um. And that's why I encourage when I, you know, think about 
you know, students in high school or middle school thinking about becoming scientists, if you ever get the idea that it might turn you into some sort of a robot or a person who no longer appreciates things in the same intense way, um, I would start thinking about it the opposite way. The more you learn and the more you engage in the attempt to create new knowledge, you, you will find the more excitement and wonder you have about life. Right, these things are a lot more connected than we see them as, especially like when you're thinking about science and art, and you have both scientists and artists on this campus, and I, I don't know how much they interact with each other, but I myself, I do a lot of science and I like art as well. I write, I write poetry sometimes. And for me, there's beauty in both of them, and they're more related than it might initially seem. Um, I guess I'm sort of having trouble communicating this idea, but uh, beauty and science and art is connected. You know, there's, there's science has its place and it has its own limitations and so does art, right? But I think that there is a lot of potential in, you know, merging, thinking between the two. Uh, I read something where a lot of successful scientists were like musicians, for example, or painters. You know, if you read about like Einstein and Feynman, they all, they had some kind of hobby, some creative task. And they were, of course, you know, the greatest scientists of their time, maybe even the greatest in, some of the greatest in history. So... Yeah, I, I agree. I, I myself am an amateur musician. I played piano and harpsichord right. um, for 30 or 40 years now. Um, and people had this idea that scientists like Bach or like certain kinds of music because it's mathematically precise. <laughs> Absolutely not in my case, for sure. Um, initially, when I started playing music, it was just an emotional, kind of a raw emotional experience um, that I just happened to love to do. As I learned more and more about the brain, and as the scientific community learned more and more th about the brain, I've become more and more interested in why music is such an emotive art form. Why does it trigger such strong emotions? And we're beginning to understand that at the level of the brain. But again, the last thing I would say about that understanding is that it's robbing the music of its emotional force for me. If anything, mm -hmm kind of knowing a little bit about what those sounds are doing in my brain when I'm playing them makes it even more intense for me. Mm, so I, guess, I, I will go home every day and play the yeah. piano for an hour. Yeah. Um, it's a wonderful mind-clearing experience, but it doesn't feel tremendously separate from my career as a scientist in any way. Right. Yeah, that's definitely um, really interesting. <laughs> That's what I was say. Another great thing about a university, we do have artists and musicians and neuroscientists all within half a mile of each other. We do not talk as much as we should. Uh, that's, what, that's what I was going to ask. Like, do you guys not as each much, other? Not <laughs> as much as we should, but when we do, it's productive. But that's not true of students at a university. Students will talk to both groups because that's how education proceeds at the university. So any of you out there listening who are thinking of a university education, that's one of the beauties of it. You can go and take a history of music course and then walk across the campus 20 minutes later and take a neuroscience course and you can relate the two, maybe better than the professors can. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Um, I feel like, I, I see a lot of people who they kind of criticize the university and they say, you know, it's a scam, they take all your money and you don't make, make that much money after. And for me, I always thought, well, it was never supposed to be a business investment. It's a place to come to learn, you know? And so I think this mentality is kind of pervading people more and more. And I'm not sure, like, how to push back against it or if I even should push back against it. I guess it's good that people are coming in. So. It's a good thing to push back against. And I think it was Derek Bach, who was president of Harvard a long time ago, was confronted with that exact question. And he said, um, if you think uh, education is inefficient, try ignorance. Um, society mm -hmm. as a whole requires education to operate as a democracy. Um, and it's not a money-making venture for the universities. It's maybe sometimes a money-making <laughs> venture for the students when they go out and have a good education and get a good job. But how much value can you put on having a job that you enjoy, that you're motivated by, that you're passionate yeah. about? That's what a university can do for you. Yeah. So what do you think of, like, a lot of people or young people that I interact with, some of my own age or some younger than me, uh, they hear, they obviously hear this, follow your passion, you know, your dreams and all that. 
a lot of people they, they don't have any kind of, kind of particular passion they can study they're like what do I like I like playing video games it's like okay then what do you do then you know so what do you, what do you make of that what would you advise someone be, be <laughs> curious about other things um, if you're at a university especially you can be curious you can go find your passion if you're if you're motivated you have to be willing to take chances and you have to be willing to gather information from courses for example that you're not comfortable with go outside of your comfort zone mm -hmm. the other thing I would say I was I was once listening to an interview with the great Wayne Gretzky a hockey player and yeah this is published a long time ago where someone asked him you know you're not the fastest skater on the ice but how come you're always in the right place and he said it's because I don't skate to where the puck is I skate to where the puck is going to be um, that's one way to approach finding your passion is don't look at the the areas of knowledge that exist right now look at combining them what's what's going to be true what what is going to be an area of knowledge 10 or 15 or 20 years from now and then start to pursue that maybe you right. love music and you're interested in neuroscience well there's no reason not to pursue the combination of the two that's mm -hmm. where some people find their passions which is moving between fields that's right. how neural engineering got started for example I think it's a big theme on our campus right working between fields and yes. interdisciplinary work it's easier said than done and, it, yeah. and often the students lead the way in that because they're willing to take chances and they're willing to break down boundaries between fields better than professors are. Professors are more risk averse, you'd say? Um, I'm not sure risk averse, but we're in a system that we've grown up in where there are boundaries of departments mm -hmm. and fields and courses. And frankly, we get busy like anyone does. Right. We run out of time to do things like that. Um, yeah. That's where the students can actually lead their professors. Okay. So it's interesting that you bring up this kind of like, it seems like there's almost a cultural aspect to it in the sense of, uh, I say culture in the sense of like, you know, your tendencies and the way you're thinking about stuff and your habits. So have you found that these themes or cultures are different at all the different universities you've been? I mean, your undergrad was at Yale and you went to Stanford and then postdoc at UCLA, University of Bristol, and now you're here. Do you see commonalities and differences between all these different campuses? or Tr Tremendous commonalities. A campus is a very comfortable, university campus is a wonderfully comfortable place for me because yeah. I know how it operates. Um, I'd say the main differences I saw were between the American universities and Bristol in England. Um, the education system is a little bit different in England and students specialize earlier. And so there's less of this exploration of different fields at universities among mm -hmm. undergraduates there. Um, their preparation is fantastic, but I think the exploration suffers a little bit. What I love about American universities, or should I say the universities in the United States, um, it, students can explore, they're even required to explore outside of their main field of interest. I hope that never goes away. Right, and a lot of students see that as a pain, and myself included, I've been guilty of this sometimes, like, <clears throat> like oh, why don't I just take this random history class, I'm an engineering major, you know? Like, why, why am I required to take these INS credits or whatever? Um, and yeah, sometimes it is kind of annoying if I can't sign up for an interesting class, but uh, I think a couple of my most interesting classes here have been outside my major, outside my field of study. And it's honestly, like I'm taking one class right now. It's called Creativity Innovation. It's a VLPA. That's Visual Literary Performing Arts. And that class is really changing the way I think. And it's probably one of the big reasons why I'm even starting this podcast. And so there's a lot of value in this kind of different, in this different type of work. It's just that students don't know what's good for them. That's the theme here. Yeah. Well, I, you know, it's one way, but I, I'm not sure I would take the risk of saying it exactly that way, but you, you, you hit upon exactly, the, yeah. exactly the, 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 from my point of view, the right thing, which is it taught you a different way of thinking. Um, there's a wonderful definition of education variously attributed to Einstein and a lot of other people, which mm -hmm. is that um, education is what's left when you've forgotten everything you learned. Um, right. It's not about the stuff. It's about the ways of thinking and the perspectives. Um, I often rem think back, I don't remember some of the things I learned. I remember the professors, what, mm -hmm. how they thought. Um, and that's what it is to, to, to take those courses you're talking about. The only, the only criticism I would have of the system is, um, you know, we get, up, we get annoyed that students are obsessed with grades, yeah. which is ridiculous because 
we, the professors, are the people who created the system that makes them obsessed with grades. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I do wish there were a way for students to take, let's say, the courses outside of their major field without the risk of worrying about not getting a good grade. That's yeah. where you take your chances, and we should somehow find a way to encourage that more and more. Mm -hmm. But it is about ways of thinking, and I, I agree with you that the courses I remember the best from college and the ones that changed the way I thought the most were not my science courses. Um, in my case, it was um, history of art classes. History of art classes. Yeah. And, it was, and I still don't remember that much about it, but it was a way of looking at paintings or a way of um, appreciating different styles of music. Um, that's what stuck with me. Not, not the details, mm -hmm. but how to think about those things. So it's an interesting statement about the nature of knowledge. And I think you, in the email you sent me, you quoted a hadith that was similar to that. I don't remember the quote exactly, but maybe uh, you remember what it was. Saying. I don't. I don't remember it. I did. It was when I looked up Ilm, the, the name of your podcast. It, yeah. was, it was something similar to the idea that education is what's left when you forget what you've learned. Right. Um, it was. I think it was. It wasn't the knowledge you acquired, but it was a gift from God. Yeah, it's like a, a light God casts into yeah, your heart. Or it's, like it's, yeah, it's 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 a light that gets put in your brain that says, "Oh, here are five different ways of thinking about the world, and it's the world I live in, and I'm only going to be here for so many years. Mm -hmm. How can I explore it in the most uh, personally intense and rewarding way possible?" Yeah. Um, that's where curiosity comes in. You just, you, I, I love to meet people who are just always curious. My view of a university sometimes is it, it gives you motivation and it gives you a little syllabus for the rest of your life. And it makes mm -hmm. you curious to, to keep learning constantly all the way through your life. Okay, so you're a neuroscientist. I'm going to ask the obvious question. Is curiosity natural or is it learned? <laughs> Oh, uh, I don't. I don't think anyone knows. But I don't even think we have a good definition of curiosity, let alone any neural mechanism. Um, but if it was I, natural, and let's say a student is naturally less curious, doesn't that put him at a disadvantage? Yes, absolutely. Not only as a student, but in my to my point of view, it puts them as a disadvantage as a person. Uh, not to be curious about the world around you. What I mean, what's life going to be like if you're stuck with only what you know now? and nothing mm -hmm. ever changes. Um, I think you have to be curious. I even think that sort of attitude plays into this horribly divisive political situation we have in the United States or in the world now. People want to keep into their own points of view and argue that they're right. There's, there's, a, I find frightening little curiosity about why people think a different way than they do. No one wants to ask a question and listen to an answer. They, yeah. want, they want to yell at people. Um, right. It, it's just more interesting and more productive if you try to get inside the other person's brain and find out why do you think the way you think that's so different from the way I think. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I think you find the common ground. And I think arguments are so counterproductive and I, I try to avoid them as much as I can. When I was younger I wasn't that way. I always used to argue with people. I was like, yeah, I'm right. I'm going to prove you wrong. But honestly, when you start arguing with someone, their brain just shuts off. You're, you're going to defense mode or something. Maybe there's, maybe there's some interesting research about this. But like, in my experience, and even myself, I'll notice that if people start arguing with me or they attack a point of view of mine, I'm not actually considering what they're saying. I'm just focusing on defending myself and proving, themselves, and proving them wrong. Mm -hmm. I think that's very common. And I think that's why you can have these huge debates and arguments that ultimately get nowhere by the end of it. Yes, that's true, and I think the word, the, you know, of course, the original word of the word argument, the original meaning had nothing to do with another person or trying to prove your point. It's just lining up facts, and it's lining up facts to back up your opinions. It didn't really have the sense of, of being in opposition to someone else. Right. We've lost that entirely. Um, I thought for a while of, of actually one way of, of trying to fix that would be to let's say in, 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 in the United States right now, get together a conservative Republican and a liberal Democrat and let them discuss something and then put rules on it. And one would be you can't mention the name of a person when you're talking. Okay. And you can't mention a political party. All right. Yeah. And you put those restrictions on it and see if you can strip down the so-called argument 
to a case where people listen. Another rule, for example, would be don't state your opinion immediately after you've heard the other person speak. The first thing you should do is repeat in your words what you yes. heard them say and ask them if you're correct. Right. If we, a few rules like that might actually get discourse in the political realm going a lot better than it is now. I right. Mean, it can't be worse than it is now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... But I think you're right. The way <laughs> arguments, if I were to do brain imaging on people arguing politics right now, I think you would see the emotional centers of the brain being by far the most active parts. Right. There it is, yeah. Someone should do that. Be I think it would be a great, maybe someone has, I don't know. Yeah. That would be interesting. But that's where, yeah. you know, sometimes scientists could mediate those sort of things nicely because we're used to criticizing each other. We do it all the time. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> um, I think it was LeBron James said, I love criticism. It makes me stronger. Right. I mean, that's how most scientists think. I mean, we don't like to be criticized, but when our work is criticized, once we get past the emotional reaction, we use it to make our work better. Yeah. I once went to a, a seminar here. It was part of the UW Institute of Neuroengineering seminars, and a visiting lecturer had come, and he had, I, I can barely remember what he talked about because it was so, like, I was way out of my depth there, but it was like, Pretty much almost all of the neurotechnology faculty were there. And so it was probably the smartest room I've been in ever. <laughs> so I think he was talking about uh, some machine learning or algorithm that he had worked on or something. And at the end, everyone was just like asking him questions about his work and all these professors were talking to each other and just, just rapid fire. I was like, wow, this is like, I felt like I was in a scene from Star Wars, you know, they have lasers shooting at each other. And they were just, Discussing the ideas didn't get like super heated or anything, which I don't know. Maybe maybe it differs among scientists. I don't know how that works, but uh, it was pretty incredible to see just people exchanging ideas and critiquing ideas really fast and I guess efficiently. There wasn't any of the noise and or uh, accompanying like issues you have in traditional I guess disagreements or arguments. So that was interesting to see. It's it, that's, that's it's nice when you see that. I I wouldn't want to leave the impression that scientists are always nice like that. Yeah. We do get into personal arguments, of course, because ego is involved in the, in the work you do. But when it can happen without ego and you really start arguing issues, scientific issues, as you saw in that room, yeah. it's intense and progress in thinking can be made. Um, it, it's a, a wonderful environment. Um, I would say for any, any students out there listening, though, that if you ever find yourself sitting in a room like that and listening to a scientific talk and you think that you're dumber than everyone else there, I have to say when I give talks, some of my favorite questions, for example, have come from a visiting high school student who's asked a mm -hmm. very basic question about what I was talking about. And uh, I would encourage you, if, you're in that, if you find yourself in that situation, don't be shy. Ask the question and tell the person in who you are and what your, the level of your knowledge is, most scientists will love to answer a very basic question like that, and sometimes they're the hardest ones. Yeah, and it's actually interesting because, it's interesting you say that because I think that exact thing happened when I was there. I was, I had just gone because I was interested in the field and I was like, all right, maybe I can pick something up. And he started talking about all this math. He was, he's a uh, math professor that I just def definitely don't have the background for. And so, I was like, okay, what can I understand from this? I started trying to parse the information, and I was formulating a question in my head, and all the other professors had asked their questions, and they were talking and everything, and I was a little bit nervous. I was pretty nervous because, like, all the professors were there. Even my own, uh, my faculty advisor from our research was there, too. So I was like, oh, okay, I got to, you know, um, you know, not make myself look bad. So I guess it's pretty natural. But then I eventually, I guess my curiosity overcame my nervousness, so I was like, let me just ask the question. And so I asked the question, and he thought about it, and he was like, huh. He started saying some stuff, and he started talking, and then all the professors started talking, and I was just like, totally forgotten, and they just started discussing the question. And so it was a pretty interesting effect, and I felt, I was, I felt proud that I was able to ask that type of question. And, um, and that's probably one of the reasons why I remember anything about that presentation. Usually when I find myself like kind of glazing out or becoming bored, I ask a question to wake myself up. Uh, but listen, I, I, I would, uh, let me point out to you the phrase that you just used. You said, my curiosity overcame my nervousness. That's what curiosity does. Right. If, if, if you're learning and, and, and you're 
asking questions of people or the world in general is driven by curiosity rather than by mm -hmm. some other motive, you almost never go wrong. What happened to you is exactly what happens when curiosity drives something you do. You have, in a sense, a very pure motivation for asking that question and it comes through and it triggers other people to think, it triggers their discussion, and you learn from it. Right, and it's really encouraging because as an undergrad, and I got involved in research pretty early my freshman year, and I always just felt like a, a lot, out of, kind of out of my depth because I was surrounded by grad students, and I'd go to the group meetings, they're all talking about stuff I have no idea about. And I've been able to find that just by, you know, thinking at almost a pretty basic level or asking a question, I can't contribute much by myself, but I can indirectly contribute by asking a question that makes other the smart people think and come up with other questions that end up leading to something good. So I think that's a, a really huge or underrated part of being involved as an undergrad in, ter in terms of um, research or things that are, I guess, at a higher level than what you're used to, in the sense that there is always a way for you to contribute something, no matter what what it is. You just have kind of to be a little bit creative about it. I, I think that's true and I think people think of, I, d I don't want people to get the impression that curiosity is just scientific curiosity. It's really just wanting to know more. Um, it's the thing that allows you to control information rather than be controlled by information. Just think of listening to a drug advertisement always mm -hmm. on the nightly news on television, you notice, so it sounds like news. Someone will stand up there and say something like this, this this drug prolongs the lives of people suffering from cancer. Well, you could just listen to that, or you could be curious and you could say, hmm, by how much? Or how did right. you know that? Um, when a politician is saying, I'm proposing a, a $50 billion tax cut, you could just sit there and say, wow, that's a lot of money. Or you could say, oh, how many dollars per person is that? Or Who's it going to go to? Right. That's curiosity. And it gets you through a lot of noise in society. Well, how does curiosity help us survive? If we're going back to the entire idea that our brain is like wired to help us survive, I guess in an indirect sense it's like, okay, it's what gave rise to all of these innovations around, it, around us. It's what gave rise to the, you know, the software and the hardware I'm using to record this right now. But from a pretty utilitarian perspective, you could say, well, what does it matter to go into things on an intellectual level for just looking at survival? It, I think it helps you organize the world around you, conceptually, make it a little simpler, search for patterns. Um, anything an organism can do to make sense of the world around it allows it to predict what might happen next. And I think if you can predict what might happen next, or if you see recurring patterns mm -hmm. of events, you're probably more likely to survive. Right. In, a, so, in an evolutionary sense, I, that's our brain is just built for trying to make patterns out of things and understand cause and effect. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting point. So I guess the bottom line there is the what that knowledge comes from curiosity or understanding comes from curiosity. And so. I think so. Yeah. I, I think of. You know, I think very far back in evolution when humans were sitting at night and looking at the sky and they wondered about things. I mean, you know, the sun started setting at a different position every day. It moved further and further north as winter approached and the days got shorter and shorter. Well, you certainly want to know if that's going to end sometime. Are mm -hmm. we going to die or the oh, day is yeah. going to start getting longer again? And notice the words we used, um, you know, the winter solstice, it means the sun stands still. That's when it reached its most, most northern point, um, or southern point setting point, and then it went back again. And so people started to look wow. for patterns, and then they knew that they could survive. Then eventually they knew they could plant at certain times of year. It's a mechanism of simplifying the world. Right. And it's probably that, that seems to be the same idea behind research as well, right? When you're, or whenever you're doing good science, that's pretty much the same concept. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I said this most northern setting point. I mean, I meant the most southern. 
Um, yeah, yeah. yeah you, you look for cycles the same way people looked up at the stars a long time ago and they noticed that they all stayed in the same relative position to each other except a few. Mm. Well, what are those things? They started calling them the wanderers. And the word was planet. Well, that curiosity led us to an understanding of the difference between stars and planets. And that gave us an idea of our own solar system. And that's what allows us mm -hmm. to predict things. Right. I, I, have, I have infinite admiration for that kind of curiosity when people were just yeah. starting to understand the world around them, how much they learned. Yeah. I was kind of thinking back, and with all of our 21st century education and knowledge or whatever, I try to think, hey, if I was there, would I have been able to come up with some of the stuff people yeah. have come up with? And I don't think so. Like, I was thinking the other day about bread. What a phenomenal invention bread was. Mm -hmm. Like, who had the idea that, let me look at these stalks of wheat and just, like, mill them together and produce this thing that rises that you can eat and produce very easily? Yeah, I agree. I, st I still can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. How did people figure out what was poisonous and what wasn't? My, unfortunately, probably by trial and error. Yeah. But the peop some of the early scientists even who started to see big patterns in things, um, it, it just astonishes me. And that, that's why it's so sometimes so valuable if you're thinking of studying science to study the history of mm -hmm. how things were discovered. Um, your admiration for the people who did that just increases so much if you think, if you, if you read about how it came about. Yeah. But those were the curious people. Hmm. So I guess we've talked about the past, and one thing I also wanted to ask you about was, uh, in, in regard to your specific research, where do you see it going in the future? I imagine as a researcher you kind of have to have a long-term vision when you're doing a project. Yes, you do. Um, and I, so, you know, we've started understanding more about the role of sleep in brain development early on. And the obvious next step for us is to try to um, take developing animals and deprive them of sleep temporarily. And while we're doing that, measure brain activity. And then see what goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And then we start to understand what does this type of activity in the brain that occurs only during sleep What's it do for the brain? Because no one really knows yet. And then we start getting this unified picture of sleep. For example, what we've discovered, we, or on the verge of discovering, I hope, is that, that sleep in the very early um, animal helps the brain develop. We already know that sleep in the adult helps the brain consolidate memory. Well, is there an analogy there? Is there something, is, are there commonalities between brain mm -hmm. development and memory consolidation? And we already know that there are similar mechanisms being used right. um, at the level of single cells. So now we start to think of, is there sort of an evolutionary commonality between the brain developing, the brain remembering, mm -hmm. the brain learning, and the brain aging? Right. And maybe it's really all the same process, and we just think of them, that process playing out early in life is called development, in the middle of life it's called learning, mm -hmm. and late in life it's called aging. But they're really not so different. Oh, okay. So, that's kind of the big picture. Right, that's pretty interesting. Um, so, when you're, if you're doing sleep deprivation, right, and let's say you notice some, there are some bad effects that are going on because of the sleep deprivation, how do you know it's because of that specific effect or, and that it's not some other thing to do with sleep? Um, well, I, I think we measure the brain activity during sleep. We measure what happens to it when the animal is deprived of sleep. And so we try to narrow it down that way, but you're absolutely right. It could, there always could be something we don't know that's happening during sleep that could do that. Um, you try the best you can with what's called a control experiment, is you try to keep only one variable in mm -hmm. place, which yeah. is sleep deprivation of this activity. Um, one way we were doing this, and this actually came from a conversation with one of my colleagues who's an expert in sleep just yesterday, we, we have to stimulate the animal when it's just about to go to sleep, and that's how we keep it from going to sleep. So how do you know the stimulus isn't the thing that's doing it? And, and you know, causing the deleterious effect on brain development. He made a wonderful suggestion, which was, 
you don't do it in the same animal. You take one animal and you measure when it's about to go to sleep. That automatically triggers the stimulus, but you deliver it to a different animal, which is not about to go to sleep. And so now you've got the same stimulus being delivered wow. to an animal, but it isn't timed on when the animal goes to sleep. Well, the hypothesis would say that that animal should not suffer the deleterious effects mm -hmm. on brain development because you're doing everything the same as you did before, but you're not linking it to sleep. So right. That's the kind of control experiment that you, you use to build up your argument. Okay, so you kind of like tack on additional things to take care of that. Yeah, what you try to do is, you, is, to, is to do everything exactly the same except for the one thing that you're trying to study. Mm -hmm. Easier said than done. Right. Okay, interesting. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about? I'm kind of out of like questions right now. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think we've covered just about everything. I, yeah, I it's just, really interesting. It was more than I imagined it would be, which is nice. Yeah, I just think yeah. of, I guess if you're, if, if, you're, if you're a student listening to this, a high school student or something, um, in addition to everything we've talked about, I can tell you a little bit of, of my own personal story, which is... Oh, yeah, that'd be good. Great, um, yeah. I ask about that. Because it, I think it has, it has some relevance to people thinking of going off to college. So um, my father was a lawyer, but he didn't start out that way. He was, um, I think, the grandson of Irish immigrants into the mm -hmm. country. Uh, his father was a steel mill worker who became foreman in a steel mill. And to give you an idea of what things were like during the Great Depression in the 1929 in this country, um, my father's father, my grandfather, saved a little bit of his paycheck back every month so that he could afford the extra electric bill in December so that he could put Christmas lights out on his house because he was the only person on the block who could afford the electricity to have Christmas lights and he thought the other kids on the block should get to see them. Mm. That gives you an idea of how it was. He, I don't think he even went to high school. I think my father was the first person in the family to go to high school. He went off to World War II as a photographer um, in airplanes. He used what's called the GI Bill to go to college and to go to law school. Mm -hmm. And he brought himself up from nothing. And then he, then he handed it over to me. But I went from that environment to Yale. That was a rich Ivy League school. I was socially totally out of my depth there. Right. I was not of the same class as most of those students. So what was that like? Was it... it was terrifying. <laughs> those students came from, you know, private schools for the wealthy. They were incredibly well prepared. Their parents were sometimes, I mean, the names of the people were known. They were just famous names. Mm -hmm. um, it was part of their culture and it wasn't part of mine. And I knew I wanted to be a scientist. I'd never heard of neuroscience. And uh, I took an introduction to the brain class, much like the one you're taking for me. Mm -hmm. It was my lowest grade in college. Oh, wow. And um, my counselor said, you could do anything. You're doing really well at an Ivy League school. You could do anything except become a neuroscientist. <laughs> I didn't take that advice. Um, but there was a, 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 an advanced neuroscience class being taught on campus. Um, I wanted to take it, but it was only for PhD students. And uh, so I lied my way into it. And by the time they caught me, I was getting a 4.0 in the class, so they didn't kick me out. And in fact, the professor in the class, who's still a friend of mine now, <laughs> lied me into the next class. <laughs> That's how I got my neuroscience. And then um, they said, you should go to Stanford to do a PhD. And I'd never heard of Stanford before. I'd never been west of the Mississippi. Um, I just packed up and went. And Wait, the, so were these schools not famous that time? Or? Oh, they were very famous at the time. I was just stupid. <laughs> I didn't know. I knew about Yale, but I didn't know about Stanford. Um, then I went off to England to work in Bristol for a while, and um, my dear sweet mother, who was living in Miami at the time, um, was horrified that I would leave the country and go live in England. And I went to visit her on the way to flying to London to live mm -hmm. there for a year. And um, when I got to England and settled down and opened my suitcase, I'd found that she had secretly unpacked everything I had in it and filled it with underwear. And put a little note in the suitcase that said, Dear Bill, I didn't know if they made underwear in third world countries like England. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I, it, there's so much randomness in that career path. Right. Um, I, 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 I would just say, you know, you don't want to get discouraged if you don't know what you want to do yet. 
Mm -hmm. um, that's what universities are for, and that's what the rest of life is for. Um, right. Things happen in kind of unexpected ways that lead to careers. Yeah. That's a, that's a cool story, thanks. Yeah. yeah, it's one of the nice things about being a scientist, too, I would <laughs> say, is among the, among the many things that are fun about being a scientist, one of them is, is you get to travel. You go to meetings, you go to conferences, you leave and work at other universities. Right. Um, you get an appreciation of other cultures if you take advantage of it. Um, and mm -hmm. that's, you know, it's a very international occupation in many ways. And I, yeah. I would hope that it could be made use of more to unify people around the world. Yeah, well, that's the entire mission here, right? That's the goal. That's the goal of your podcast. Yeah, cool. All you want to do is unify the world. Modest goal. Yeah, <laughs> that's all. Not, not, not a tall order. All right, well, what? thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Uh, I really enjoyed it, and it ended up being even better than I thought it would be. So. Fantastic. This is cool. Hopefully people will enjoy listening to it. I hope so, too. Yeah, yeah. all right. Well, I'm going to turn this off now. Thank you. Thank you to the viewers for tuning in on this first of hopefully many awesome episodes. And maybe if it ends up being cool, we can do it again with, uh, with better equipment. No, it'd be, it'd it'd be interesting fun. to do it again. and. You know, see if any if people submit any kind of questions or things to you. Or you oh yeah, hey, that's a good idea, huh? I should I open up questions or something. You could open up questions and then we yeah. could get together and you could you could present them to me cold and see what happens. Ah, that'd be fun. Yeah. All right. Sign off for now then.